In this segment, I want to talk about one of my favorite ideas in all of physics, and that's resonance. And I'm just going to start off with a quick demo. Um, here I have three pieces of pasta, and on top of these three pieces of pasta are three pieces of Play-Doh. And that makes them pretty wiggly, right? And we can see, you know, if I give this guy a little flick, he vibrates quite quickly. This guy vibrates a little slower, and this guy vibrates slowest of all. So, I want you to make a prediction. I'm going to shake my hand back and forth here in a moment, and I want you to predict which one of these will have the greatest amplitude. And recall that amplitude is this word, and it tells us what the maximum displacement from equilibrium is. So, in other words, which one will have the greatest swing? Uh, you, well, feel free to pause the video and think about it a little bit if you need to. Okay, well, let's just give it a shot here. I'm going to go ahead and shake my hand back and forth. We'll see which one wiggles with the greatest amplitude. Oh, do you see that it is the smallest, the shortest one? That's interesting. Now, I'm not there with you, so I'm not sure what your prediction was. But most people, when I do this in class, they predict that this big one will wiggle the most. So I say again, I'm going to shake my hand again. Which one will wiggle with the greatest amplitude? Well, at this point, hopefully I've convinced you it will be the small one. Ew, maybe not. Okay, so it's the big one, or it's the small one, or maybe it's the middle one? Wait a minute. What gives? I can make the little one vibrate most, and by most I mean with the greatest amplitude. I can make the middle one vibrate most, again with the greatest amplitude, or the longest one vibrate with the greatest amplitude. What gives? You know, I'm, I'm not doing anything you can't see here, right? This is not a magic trick. There's no sleight of hand. What this is, is a nice demonstration of resonance. Each one of these different pastas has a different natural frequency. Well, what is natural frequency? Ah, it's the frequency that something wants to vibrate at. So if I give this a little flick, we see that it vibrates at a certain rate. It has a certain frequency. If I just let it do its thing, I'm not driving it. I'm not shaking my hand. I'm just giving it a little flick. And you'll notice that the smallest pasta vibrates much quicker, right? It has a natural frequency that is much higher than this one. And of course, the middle pasta has a natural frequency that's somewhere in between. When I match the frequency of my shaking hand to the natural frequency of the pasta, that's the one that vibrates with the greatest amplitude. So if I want to make the middle one vibrate with the greatest amplitude, I need to shake my hand at that frequency. And I can do that if I concentrate. If I want to make the shortest one vibrate with the greatest amplitude, then I have to shake my hand at this frequency. I have to match the frequency that I am shaking my hand with to the natural frequency, or the frequency that the pasta wants to vibrate with. Piece of cake. If I shake it slower, I can make the biggest one vibrate. So that's pretty cool, right? There's some terminology we need here. Okay, so I used most of these terms a moment ago. A driven oscillation is some oscillation that's driven. In other words, it's not just spontaneously vibrating. It's vibrating because something is making it vibrate. And these pastas were a great example of that. They weren't just vibrating on their own. They were vibrating because I was shaking my hand and making them vibrate. Now, each one of those pastas had a different natural frequency. The natural frequency of a system, it's, it's what it wants to vibrate at. And I realize that's anthropomorphizing these systems just a little bit, because, of course, my pasta probably has no desire to do anything. It's the frequency that something will vibrate with if I just give it a little ting or, or somehow displace it from equilibrium and let it do its thing, right? That's the natural frequency. And, you know, almost everything has a natural frequency. The driving frequency is the frequency that the system is being driven at. And so that's the rate of the wiggle. Remember, frequency is the rate of the wiggle. So that's the rate that the system is being driven at. For the case of the pasta demo, that's the frequency that I was wiggling my hand back and forth. We see resonance when the driving frequency matches the natural frequency. And how do we know that's happening? An increase in amplitude is observed. And in the case of the pasta, it was really easy to see that increase in amplitude. Now, almost everything has its own natural frequency. 
This is the reason why, when you knock a tool off of the workbench behind you and you didn't see it hit the ground, you can tell by listening whether it was a hammer or a wrench, right? You don't need to be some skilled acoustician in order to tell whether it was a hammer or a wrench. They just sound different. They just have different natural frequencies, right? That has a certain sound. That has a different sound, right? They just sound different. Almost everything has its own natural frequency. Here I have a couple of wine glasses. This one is somewhat thinner and um, a bit smaller. It's lighter. Uh, this one is a little bit bigger around. It is shorter, but it's bigger around. Um, and it's a little bit heavier. Which of these two do you think would have the higher natural frequency? Well, we can just see. Maybe some of you have done this trick. If I get my finger wet and run it around the edge of the glass, we can make it oscillate. And let's see what that sounds like. Okay, that's its natural frequency. That pitch that we're hearing is its natural frequency. We're going to talk a little bit more about sound here in uh, the next couple weeks. Um, but for now, we'll just say that pitch is the musical word for frequency. So if you hear a higher pitch, you have heard a higher frequency. Let's compare that to this. Ooh, that's lower, isn't it? And that's higher. A smaller glass, I kind of expect to have a higher natural frequency. Just like with the pasta, the shorter piece of pasta had the higher natural frequency, and the longer piece of pasta had the lower natural frequency. A little bit higher, a little bit lower. Any musical instrument is able to play specific notes it's because there's something in that interest, instrument that has a well-defined natural frequency. That na whatever that natural frequency is, that's what defines the pitch that that instrument is playing. Here I have a very large instrument. This is a large instrument, isn't it? And I have a very small instrument of a very similar shape. Which of these two instruments do you think would have tend to have the higher natural frequency? Well, I'll bet you predicted the small one, right? And indeed, if we are to just play a random note on here, that's quite a high pitch compared to this right here. But we have to be really careful here because it's not the natural frequency of the instrument that we're hearing in general. It's specifically the natural frequency of one of these strings that we're hearing. And so I can play one of these strings and it vibrates at its natural frequency when I displace it from equilibrium and let it do its thing. We hear a well-defined frequency, a well-defined pitch. Similar to just the size of the instrument, this string is big and heavy and thick. This string is much thinner and not as heavy. And so I expect the thinner, not as heavy string to have a higher natural frequency. And indeed, they do. Now we have to be careful. People will often use this term resonance to mean rich sounding or loud, like they might describe the sound of this upright bass as resonant. And what they mean is it sounds beautiful and rich. But that's not a good scientific use of the word resonance. What we mean in this class when we talk about resonance is when the driving frequency equals the natural frequency, we see an increase in amplitude. Now, is there resonance happening here? There is, but it's a little bit complicated. And frankly, I don't really want to get into it. For right now, I'm using this as an example of how everything just sort of has its own natural frequency. And that becomes very important for different instruments. In this case, we change the note of this instrument by changing the natural frequency of the different strings. We could play a heavier string to make the frequency lower, but we could also shorten the length of the string to make the frequency higher. We've seen that for a stringed instrument, like a violin, it's the natural frequency of one of the strings that defines the pitch that you hear. For an instrument that you blow through, like a brass instrument or a woodwind instrument, it's actually the natural frequency of the air inside that defines the pitch. Here is a traditional Fort Collins instrument. This is a piece of PVC pipe. <laughs> Beautiful. 
beautiful. Ah, touches my soul. Uh, it's actually the air inside, the natural frequency of the air inside that produces this note, that defines the note. And some people might think, oh, well, it's the, the vibrating of my lips that defines the note. Mm. Well, the vibration in the tube gets started by me buzzing my lips, but I can do that, and it's actually the same pitch. It's actually the same pitch. So I'm starting the vibration with my lips, but the pitch that I hear is defined by the natural frequency of the air inside this tube. Is this an example of resonance? A minute ago I said people often use the term resonant incorrectly. Is this resonance? You know, that's not a terribly pleasant note, isn't it? It, it kind of sounds almost like a, a ship's horn or something, right? Uh, it's not, I, I don't think anyone would describe that as beautiful, and I doubt if very many people would describe that as resonant. Yet, this is resonance phenomena. It's a little bit more complicated than the demonstration that I showed you with the pasta. In that case, the driving frequency had one specific well-defined frequency, the rate of the wiggle of my hand. That was the driving frequency. In this case, the driving frequency is produced by my lips. And my lips, actually, when I do this, I'm producing a wide range of frequencies, a whole bunch of frequencies, from low frequencies to very high frequencies. Which one do you hear when I do this? When I do that, the frequency you hear is the frequency, the natural frequency, of the air inside. So I'm driving at a great many frequencies. The one that I hear is the natural frequency. So is that resonance? I guess so. Because the driving frequency has a wide range of frequencies. Which one do I hear? The one that is in resonance with the air inside this tube. Okay, so let's look back, now that we've talked a little bit more about it. Let's look back at these definitions. The natural frequency, remember, is the frequency of a system if it's displaced from equilibrium and just allowed to do its thing. It's the frequency that the system wants to oscillate at. Resonance happens when the driving frequency matches the natural frequency. How can we tell that resonance is happening? We see a marked increase in amplitude. Let's look at a graph that can help us wrap our brain around that last point about what resonance is. Here's a graph, and on the vertical axis we see amplitude. It's just the amplitude of the oscillation. In the case of the sound wave, it's the amplitude of that sound wave. In the case of the pasta, you know, the amplitude would be defined for, as, you know, the distance from that center equilibrium position to the farthest swing. So it's how far over is the pasta swinging. And on the horizontal axis, we see the driving frequency uh, in hertz. So this is the driving frequency, and this is the amplitude of oscillation of the system. This particular system has a natural frequency of 2 hertz. So notice if I drive this frequency at some very low... If, so if I drive this system at a low frequency, then I will see a very small amplitude. But you know what? I can see the exact same amplitude if I drive it with a fast frequency or a large frequency. When do I see the greatest amplitude? when I exactly match the driving frequency to the natural frequency. That's when I see the greatest amplitude of oscillation. Maybe some of you have experienced this in a car or a bicycle that you've ridden. I had a car when I was younger, and it got a shimmy in it. I've actually owned two cars that had a shimmy in them. And maybe if you're like me and you've driven some really crappy cars in your life, you've had that experience too. But I've had these cars, and they got a real shimmy going at 65. You know, if you're going 45, it's okay. You're fine around town. You get out on the freeway, and you hit 65, and it's like this. So what do you do? You speed up. You get to 75, and it starts to smooth out again. Why? Because when the wheels are turning at just the right rate, so that the driving frequency, whatever's wobbling in your wheels, matches the natural frequency, hmm, your car is on springs, right? Your car is on springs, and those springs have a well-defined natural frequency. So when the rate of the rotation of your wheels matches the natural frequency of the springs on your car, your car shakes all over the place. But you get those wheels turning faster or slower, and your car doesn't shake nearly as much. The phenomenon of resonance is also super important for understanding how our hearing works. Many people uh, who are not 
particularly musically inclined, who haven't spent a lot of time practicing music, are, tend to say, uh, I'm tone deaf. But you know what? Tone deafness, like actual tone deafness, is very, very rare. And if you can tell the difference between this and this, then you are not tone deaf. You just maybe haven't practiced enough to be able to identify those in some musically useful sort of a way. But the fact is, there are very, very few people who cannot distinguish a high pitch from a low pitch, a high frequency from a low frequency. It's a very rare condition. And the reason is, is because there are structures in our ears which respond differently to these sounds than they do to these sounds. Where are those structures? Well, inside your ear, it's a very, there's a lot of complicated anatomy going on in your ear. And, and you know what, maybe many of you uh, have learned more about this anatomy than I have, but there's one part of this anatomy that I am prepared to discuss. Uh, so these sound waves, we're going to talk a lot more about sound as we go along, but sound waves are basically vibrating air. So, a sound wave is, is air that's vibrating. When a sound wave hits my ear, the air is vibrating back and forth. That causes my eardrum to vibrate. There's a series of three bones here. Collectively, they're known as the ossicles. And they transmit that vibration into this cochlea. Inside the cochlea is the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane has structures within it that respond differently to different frequencies. In fact, your ear has structures that are not that different from the pasta that I demonstrated earlier. You have structures in your ear that look very similar to this. In fact, here is a zoomed-in view, a electron microscope view of a hair bundle. These are structures that are in your ear. When a sound wave vibration is passed into your inner ear, these hair cells vibrate. And which ones vibrate? The hair cells that respond to the frequency of the sound wave are the ones whose natural frequency matches the frequency of the sound wave. So you have structures in, the, in your ear with a very low natural frequency. These allow you to hear low notes. And you have structures in your ear that are very small and have a high natural frequency. Those hair cells respond to high frequencies. Guess which ones are flimsier? Well, by now, you should be convinced that these smaller ones the flimsier ones respond to high frequencies. If you're exposed to loud sounds, which part of your hearing do you lose first? Well, you lose the high frequency range first. That's why grandpa has a hard time hearing your speech, is because he has lost some of his high frequency hair cells. They've been damaged or degraded over time. But it is very similar to the pasta. And so if you think you're tone deaf, frankly, I probably don't believe. Okay, so resonance, super cool. We're going to talk a lot more about sound waves and waves in general in the next couple of chapters. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about um, all year.